I'm Robert Thurman, and I'm the president of Tibet House U.S. at the request of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to um, spearhead, with the help, always with the help of my wife, Nina, his cultural center in America. And uh, I have been studying now since um, I've known His Holiness the Dalai Lama, or a little bit earlier than that, for about 54 or 55 years, um, every, all things Tibetan. My initial interest, of course, was the high philosophical um, and scientific teachings that Tibet has preserved from ancient Buddhist India, where the enlightened Buddha and many of his enlightened followers explored the nature of physics, the nature of biology, the nature of psychology primarily, and founded great universities where they also did botany and medicine, linguistics, logic, mathematics, astronomy, so many different sciences. And uh, I still, maybe some people would think I'm an expert about it, but I consider myself like an explorer who's just peeking from the horizon at a vast uh, panoply of knowledge and beauty and art, which is the amazing multi-thousand-year-old culture of Tibet. And particularly, of course, my interest is in its Buddhist culture, where Tibet is the receptacle, the crucible, the hidden um, safety deposit vault, wherein the great knowledge and wisdom and art and culture and educational systems uh, that were developed for 1500 years, 1600 years in ancient Buddhist India have been preserved, because, which is particularly important because due to various invasions beginning about a thousand years ago, these things were destroyed in India. Although actually quite a lot of their treasure uh, material is preserved in what is called Hinduism, but without really being self-aware of its origin in the Buddhist tradition. So, so now why, why do we make this such a... This is one of the reasons we do make a fuss about the uniqueness and the importance of Tibetan culture in the world, in that it somehow, you know, it has become famous around the world because of the Tibetan great teachers of Tibet, many of them being in exile, because Tibet itself has been closed off from the world pretty much, by the Chinese occupation, except for a certain flood of tourists who just go around and superficially see buildings and landscapes. But the, the, the people that they talk to have been basically had their culture suppressed now for 60 years. So it can only be encountered in the exile communities in Nepal and India and overseas, in the US, you know, in Switzerland, in, other, in Australia and other countries. And why do we make such a, of course, all human cultures are immensely valuable, each one intrinsically in its own way. And what is special, I feel, and why have I devoted so much of my life, professional and personal and spiritual life, to it, is that Tibet is an exception. The history of Tibet is exceptional in the history of nations, in that uh, before the year... 800 or so, Tibet was a conquest empire, a dynastic empire that conquered its neighbors and was, it was uh, spearheaded by ruthless warriors and generals. The Chinese feared them, the Central Asian Turks and Mongols feared them, the Persians to the west of them feared them, the Nepalis and the Indians to the south of them feared them. And the only good thing about them, from their neighbor's point of view, was that they liked living above 10,000, 11,000 feet the altitude on their plateau. And so they only you know, raided, looted, and pillaged. And then they would go back to enjoy the fruits of their pillage uh, up in their homeland and wouldn't usually try to occupy you. So they weren't that kind of a spreading empire. They were just a raiding empire, but huge. And Tibet itself is huge. It is the entire plateau, traditionally, which is like over a million square miles, bigger than the whole of the U.S. west of the Mississippi. So that was how Tibet was. And we in the West 
and also in many countries in the East, are brought up with the idea that one natural part of a civilized society is to be armed with military and actually to highly prize and esteem the profession of warrior and respect the killer, you know, person, you know, even hunting or killing in war. And uh, Tibet was no exception. But Tibet made a choice which was slowly, so initially top down, but then secondarily bottom up from the grassroots. They made a choice of demilitarizing and and really living and embodying mainstream in their culture, the Buddhist principles of nonviolence and openness of heart and openness of mind, choosing vulnerability actually and the danger of being invaded by neighbors and things like that. Uh, Tibet chose that path as leading to a much more satisfying lifestyle and as also in the way they would put it, using their, the precious jewel of a human embodiment endowed with liberty and opportunity to use a, a lifetime as an, an evolutionary step in an, in an escalator, in a platform leading to a, an evolutionary stage of full enlightenment or Buddhahood or Bodhisattvahood or Buddhahood which is a higher way of being than the ordinary self-centered being according to Buddhist teaching. Now, I don't say that Tibet is unique in the sense that it's the first culture that mainstreamed that, those principles. I consider that Shakyamuni Buddha's own city-state kingdom in India mainstreamed it during his life and immediately suffered the consequence in that case because there were 15 other rival city-state kingdoms like, you know, in Greece you had Athens and Sparta and the Peloponnesus and Corinth and all these things, you know. All of Eurasia was, was carpeted by city-state kingdoms. In those days, Troy you know, was one of them, Babylon and so on. And, and um, they were rivals and they would fight each other. And so, so many of the young warriors of the Shakya kingdom were so moved by the new vision of life that the Shakyamuni Buddha opened up to them that they quit being warriors, they abandoned posts, so to speak, in the Shakya military, and they joined the mendicant order, in a way they joined the education system of the Buddhists, which was a nonviolent system, they are disarmed, they are not nationally identified as having a, you know, patriotic and therefore making the neighboring nation an enemy and so on. It's a completely, in a way, a socially transcendent and revolutionary movement with global, global reach, as it has turned out over the thousands of years. But they suffered, and therefore, in a way, they disappeared in history. And there were a number of kingdoms in India over the next 1,500 years that virtually demilitarized and made India so more gentle, and therefore opened India, vulner, India's vulnerability to invasions from Iran and from Central Asia and eventually from Europe by Muslims and Christians which then completely suppressed India's special kind of gentle culture. And so much so that some modern Indian sages, even spiritual ones, kind of blame the Buddhist tradition in Indian history for making India too demilitarized and the Indian people too gentle and through making sort of the martial killer kind of um, ideal not a high ideal but rather making nonviolence a high ideal, as we see politically in the, in the great movement for Indian liberation spearheaded by Mahatma Gandhi. So that's, that is something uniquely Indian. So there were nations in India, there are many, but there were nations in India who also demilitarized and chose the arts of peace over the arts of war, which is something that the way our history is taught in the West it, nobody just does that. That's just that's suicide because life is inherently violent. People are inherently bad, etc. There's all this kind of a worldview which Buddha does not agree with, and the Buddhist system, social system, does not agree with. So, you know, the, we do hear also here. I should say, there are of course wonderful Buddhist elements of cultures all the way from Sri Lanka to Japan and Korea and China. And, Southeast Asia, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, all this sort of thing. In the old days, even Indonesia was very strongly Buddhist. And so there are elements 
of that. But I, but though there, Buddhism is like a counterculture, in the sense that the mainstream culture is still the king and the army, and the notion of national self-aggrandizement and national patriotic, you know, power projection. Let's say def both defense and power projection. And so in those cultures, Buddhism never became mainstream. It would moderate, of course, the violence of them, and it would introduce a level of openness and of beautiful art, art of beauty and things like that in those cultures. But now and then the king, in order to get more men back for his army and more wealth away from the monastics uh, who get their free lunch and so forth and their universities, would prune it back, you know, because it was only countercultural. Just like, in a way, you could say Christianity in the European countries was countercultural in that it never succeeded in, in in completely pacifying any particular country, and then people get into onward Christian soldiers, even though Jesus himself said, you know, turn the cheek, you know, love your enemy, you know, just like Buddha did. But um, a countercultural, in other words, spiritual and religious force tends to be co-opted by the dominant mainstream aspect of the culture, which, is, which, which really is violence in the case of most of history. However, this Tibet is an exception. So this is the exceptional nature of Tibetan culture. If you could imagine how American culture would be if all the members of the military service were like one giant Peace Corps, and they were all doing, singing rock and roll songs, they were making movies, they were going out and building houses for poor people. They were helping, you know, plant forests. They were, uh, you know, uh, helping harvest uh, crops and uh, controlling floods and, you know, whatever. And all of their work had to do with peace. How beautiful. And if all the funding that went to the military went to arts of peace in America, how amazing would our culture be? And it, as it will be, actually, indeed, because this is what we will be doing in the future, in my opinion. And in any case, therefore, at this time, when we're clearly not doing that, however, we do have the presence of Tibetan culture here in this country. We do have Tibet House U.S. We have Menla Mountain Retreat. There are Tibetan meditation centers, Dharma centers, and, and there's a wonderful nunnery in eastern Washington State, another one in Newfoundland, and, um, and Newfoundland, Nova Scotia area. And um, it's really quite marvelous the influence already of a bunch of refugee people that they're already exerting, letting people know the value and glory of inner peace in the process of seeking world peace. So this is the this is sort of the real root of this thing. And then in that light then, uh, the Tibetan education curriculum is organized around really making a better person, not just getting more information, not just getting sharper critical mind, although those things are very much there, not just improving one's skills in writing and composing and doing artwork and things like that and doing medical healing work and so forth, in the arts, you know, not only that, but also becoming a more compassionate being, a more wise being, having a deeper understanding of the nature of the world and therefore being more realistic in one's way of dealing with it understanding the deeper nature of human illness and health, and therefore being able to interact as a nurse or a doctor or compassionately and effectively with living beings. So, so these are all, but the root of it is the shift from nonviolence, from violence to nonviolence, that may became a mainstream thing in Tibet. And then the proof of that pudding, secondarily, is that the Tibetans then over some more centuries they managed to spread that culture to the Mongolians. And we, we all know, like, you know, Genghis Khan is like a household word in the West. And the military violence, effectiveness, predatoriness of the Mongolians was well known. They had a, they had a conquest empire larger in land territory to the British than the British Empire, in fact, actually at their heyday in the 13th and early 14th century. And, um, and yet they became complete peaceniks like the Tibetans. And I, when I say complete peacenik, I just mean the country demilitarized. The military budget was a tiny fraction. In Tibet, they wandered around in 8th century uniforms, carrying a sword and a spear. You know, they didn't try to modernize in the slightest. And uh, the Mongolians, of course, they look with pride back to their time as a conqueror just on a human level. 
But in a way, they, they admire more of those enlightened beings who became gentle and nonviolent than they do the violent ones. Although now, after uh, almost a century of being dominated by communists, there's a, some of the young people are, and being sort of their own culture being crushed in Mongolia. They're kind of not sure. Maybe they should have stuck with Genghis sometimes, they, they think, although we try to help discourage them. But anyway, Tibet managed to export that unique culture to Mongolia and pacified the Mongolians, which is certainly a benefit to them. Then we say, well, okay, so that's great, that culture. Say you concede that, <coughs> my, getting my point. But then we can say, when people do, well, but then in the 20th century, Tibet and Mongolia were crushed themselves by communist invasions from China and Russia uh, in both in, in those two cases. And so maybe what good is that culture anyway, people might say. And here we must engage maybe in a little bit of visionary thinking in the sense that, yes, it has been good for nation building and empire building to have strong military. And the root of a strong military, of course, is a culture that idealizes the warrior, the hero warrior, so that people seek that profession, honors it also with support and, and status and money and, um, you know, commemoration and so forth. And, um, and that's what militarized cultures do. And um, so that's, that's the root of it. So, in other words, the survival instinct in our history has been therefore associated, I mean, by not, when I are, I'm saying all people on the planet, has been associated with having a certain degree of power and expertise in administering violence, fighting a successful aggressive war, defending yourself aggressively. This is what a nation needs. This people are called to arms, basically, right, in the world. But now, Due to our human intelligence, actually, which involves our material science and involves our technologies of warfare and violence, we have reached a point where it's no longer possible to have an all-escalating war. It's simply impossible. An escalating war, World War III, would obliterate winners as well as losers. There would be no way of winning that war. It would obliterate perhaps all life on Earth. There is such, there's such a power of the nuclear weapons, and there's also biological and, and chemical weapons. I mean, it's just, it's beyond belief, the level of destructiveness that has been unleashed through our intelligence and our technology of violence. So therefore, although the skill that was developed in specific nations, starting with the Shakya kingdom of Buddha's own Shakya kingdom, and extending to the whole of India, and then being preserved in Tibet and being spread into Mongolia, where it's also preserved, just up until recent times. A culture that has developed this sort of wisdom and compassion, the cultural skill to choose that vulnerability, to thrive in a disarmed condition, to develop a new ideal of the internal warrior who conquers the self rather than conquering other people. You know, this skill and this cultural and social and historical achievement becomes highly valuable because what, what the US, Russia, China, European Union, Japan, the Arabian peoples, you know, different Muslim nations, what the, what the nations and the sort of leftover empires what they need now is how to choose vulnerability. I, I, I express this in a slogan, how to shift from mad mutual assured destruction to mud, unil unil mutual unilateral disarmament. 